Tonight we are fortunate to have um, Dean Milano here to talk about um, the music of the 60s and 70s. When um, my husband and I talk music, I'm always telling him that was the best era of music. Um, I'm a child of the 70s, not a child of the 60s, but um, I tell him all the time it was the best era, and he says to me, you know, they put out good stuff in the 80s, 90s, and they're still putting out good stuff now. Name one. And, and I said to him, that's because they're redoing everything from the 60s and 70s. Um, so um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dean Milano, and we'll see what he has to say about that very thing. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. I was going to say, you look a little too young to know much about the 60s. <laughs> okay, my name is Dean Milano. I'm the author of the book, The Chicago Music Scene of the 60s and 70s, uh, which we have here. My friend Sandy will be walking around with that book later on in case you're interested in picking up a copy. Um, and we're going to talk about that book tonight. Before we talk about the book, would you like to hear a little music from some Chicago uh, yes. musicians? Okay. I'll do a little bit for you. These are songs by Chicago musicians. You may recognize some of them. You may not recognize all of them, though. Cupid, draw back your bow and let your arrow go straight to a lover's heart. Oh, me, nobody but me. Cupid, please hear my cry and let your arrow fly straight to a lover's heart. Oh, me. Now, I don't mean to bother you, but I'm in distress. It's danger of me losing all of my happiness. For I love a girl who doesn't know I exist. And this you can fix. So, Cupid, draw back your bow and let your arrow go. Straight to my lover's heart. Oh, me, nobody but me. Cupid, please hear my cry and let your arrow fly straight to the lover's heart. Oh, me. Hey, Cupid, don't you hear me? Calling, I need you. Oh, Cupid, oh, help me. City, feeling dirty and gritty. I got holes in my shoes and I can't find my way home. Next month I'm gonna head up river. There's a gal, Missouri, just makes me quiver. The riverboat captain is a looking for me. Seems I wasn't too nice to little Sally. If you're looking for love, I got a wrap sitting in the bay. We can drift by the light of the moon if we can slip away. Hit Panama City, feeling dirty and gritty. I got holes in my shoes and I can't find my way home. Way home. songs. Uh, the first one, of course, was Cupid by the great Sam Cooke. Uh, the last song was People Get Ready by Curtis Mayfield. 
Uh, and the song in the middle was a thing called Panama City, a song that I wrote back in 1971, and I did on the circuit for many years. I still do it to this day. It's on one of my CDs here. Um, just to show you that a lot of music has been written and performed in Chicago by people like me that you never probably ever heard of. Uh, and it's out there, we're all, we're all doing original music, and that was, that was one of them. We may not become famous, but uh, what the heck. Uh, so today we're, we're gonna talk about uh, the Chicago musicians that I mentioned in the, in that are in the, the book here, and I'm gonna see if I can get this to work here. Um, in fact, speaking of myself, if you look at the screen up there, the guy all the way on the left in the black shirt is me. That was my first band. Uh, uh, back in 1966, we played at a, a, a restaurant called Richard's Restaurant on Harlem Avenue in uh, Chicago. I think we got 30 bucks for the whole band that day. I used to but, go there. Did you? Richard, yeah. 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 The, 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 the restaurant's there. It's called something else now, but the restaurant's still there uh, on Harlem and Bruin. Um, and that was a start for me. I mean, I, that was my first paid gig, and man, I never looked back after that. Never planned a I mean, career as a musician, but boy, that, that, that did it for me, playing that gig. And ever since then, I've never stopped. So we're going to see if we can get this to work. It worked. Okay. I'm going to start off, first of all, with a little summary of what the book is about, the essence of the book. Um, this is a story of two decades of the Chicago music scene, the 1960s and 1970s, an incredibly vibrant period in urban and suburban music scenes across the country and throughout the world. Chicago, thanks to an abundance of highly talented musicians and bands, was a major player throughout those decades. It was a time when jazz, rock and roll, country and western, folk, blues, R&B, just about every type of music imaginable flowed, flowed through the streets of Chicagoland. And much has been written about the national and international talent of that time, but not enough has been written regarding the local music scenes. So this story focuses on the city of Chicago and the suburban club scene, and the homegrown performers who made it one of the most electrifying and memorable periods in music history. Some of those players went all the way to the big time, while others made their names and kind of disappeared. But they all made a difference in their own way, and for those who were there, it's a time they'll never forget. And those of you who were there, I'm sure you know what I mean by that. We're going to start with the Chicago folk music scene here. Chicago folk music scene began to take root in the early 1960s, particularly at a club called the Gate of Horn, uh, one of the first folk music clubs in the country. Uh, if you've seen this new film, what's it called? Finding Lu Finding Lewin Davis, is that what it's called? Uh, the Coen Brothers film. There, there's, a, there's a scene that's in the, uh, the Gate of Horn in that film. Um, it was owned by Albert Grossman, uh, who some of you may remember as the manager of Bob Dylan, Peter, Paul, and Mary, the Rolling Stones, uh, and a lot of other bands. Um, and the other thing that Chicago had going for it at that time was the fact that the Old Town School of Folk Music set up here in Chicago and had a major influence on the scene. Um, Anyone here remember a band called The Birds? Okay. Well, one of the biggest hits of call, of course, was Mr. Tambourine Man. Hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, play a song for me. I'm not sleepy and there ain't no place I'm going to. You're probably wondering why I'm playing that song. It's not a Chicago song. It's a Bob Dylan song. He was from Minneapolis. But the song was made very famous by a band called The Birds, as I mentioned. And, of course... Uh, one of the major players in the Birds was a fellow named Roger McGuinn, who later became Jim McGuinn. Uh, and if you look at the picture up there right now, the fellow with the big ears there, all the way on the left, that's Roger McGuinn at the Old Town School of Folk Music. When he was teaching music there, and he had a little folk group here in Chicago, and that's how he got started, and then he moved on out to California. And uh, he sent me that, uh, that picture to use in the book. He's a very nice guy, and I was, I was thankful to him for that one. Oh, it worked, okay. I'm sure a lot of you guys recognize the lady in the middle there, uh, and I'll bet you didn't know that uh, that Cass Elliott had a folk group called Triumvirate right here in Chicago, playing all the local uh, the folk venues in Chicago at that time. Uh, and of course, after that, she moved out to California where they formed the, uh, the Mamas and the Papas and became huge out there, but she started right here in, uh, in Chicago. And I didn't even know that myself. <laughs> I gotta check to see if it works each time. There we go, okay. And let me know if you can't hear me, this is difficult doing this with the microphone, so if I pull away from it and you can't hear me, somebody scream and yell at me, let me know. Okay, this is the Old Town School of Folk Music. Um, it was based on Armitage Avenue in the city of Chicago. It was founded by Wynn Strachey, 
Don Greening and Frank Hamilton. Uh, and it was known for its method of teaching, which involved large classes for folk music, uh, folk dancing, other subjects. Uh, see this works here? I'll have to get that down. Here we go. Okay. This is a folk music class. Uh, this is Ray Tate. He was one of the directors of the uh, school at one point, and he's teaching a guitar class here where they would bring everybody in all at once. They'd bring all their guitars in and they'd play the same chords and bash away. And it was, it was a kind of a new concept that they were trying out, and it worked fairly well because obviously they're still doing it to this day. Uh, and, uh, oddly enough, this seems to be a very male-dominated class here. I see one lady up on stage there, but there uh, seems to be a lot of ladies at this point. There you go. I'm sure somebody recognized these fellows. Wynn Strachey, the founder, and Studs Terkel. Uh, this is during an impromptu sing-along at the old school town school one night. Uh, Studs was a major supporter of the school uh, and Chicago uh, folk music in general through his WFMT radio show. Um, and this is kind of one of my claims to fame here because these guys are singing on my microphone, believe it or not. <laughs> My group was, was performing that night. Studs Turkle had a, a book signing for his book that had just come out called Working, and the, my band was performing for his book signing. That was my mic that walked up and sang. And that picture's been in magazines and books all over the world. I'm like, hey, there's my microphone. The one I still use, still use to this day. It so, yeah, still works. <laughs> Bob Gibson and Hamilton Camp, of course, folk superstars of the 1960s. Their regular shows at the Gate of Horn were legendary. Uh, Hamilton Camp, of course, went on to TV and movies. Bob Gibson, there he is. Bob Gibson became a regular on TV shows such as Hoot Nanny. Some of you might remember Hoot Nanny. Um, and I just found out something interesting about Hoot Nanny. I didn't know was that Hoot Nanny did not allow Pete Seeger to perform on that television show because of his communist leanings. Uh, and several performers refused to be on the show because Pete couldn't be on the show. Uh, I think uh, Joan Baez was one of them. She would not go on Hoot Nanny because of that. That was kind of interesting to hear. Um, but Bob, did, uh, Bob Gibson did a lot to promote the Chicago folk music sound around the entire country and the whole world. Um, some of you might know some of his songs. One of my favorites was Abilene, Abilene, prettiest town I've ever seen. Folks down there don't treat you mean in Abilene. I sit alone. Most every night, watch them trains roll out of sight. Wish that they were carrying me to Abilene, my Abilene. Abilene, Abilene, prettiest town I've ever seen. Folks down there don't treat you mean in Abilene. That's a great old Bob Gibson song. I was lucky enough to play bass with Bob. He, he wandered into a club I was playing one night and asked if he could come up and play some songs. And I said, yeah, come on up. And I had my bass and we played a bunch of tunes. And that was, that was great. That was a lot of fun. What do we have next? Ah, OK, the Heartland Cafe. This is a place up in Rogers Park. They've been in business since 1970. And this was the center for community activities revolving around music events back in those days. Um, young people probably don't have a concept that music really did belong to the people as opposed to corporations back in those days. And uh, having a beer company or a car company sponsor a band, that was unheard of. I mean, that would have been looked down on by, by musicians and lovers of music in general. It just, it just didn't happen. The music was, was really ours back at that time. Of course, that's, that's changed a lot now. Uh, but the owners of the Heartland Cafe, and they still own it today, uh, were constantly organizing music events to benefit the poor and underprivileged in the area. Uh, it was the kind of community connection to the music that I don't really think was on all that, that much today, and it, it was very important back then. This, of course, is the Earl of Old Town on Well Street, and uh, this was the place to play if you were a folk singer back in those days. And a lot of folk musicians that I talked to uh, moved here to Chicago just so they could get a gig at the Old Old Town. Uh, I ended up playing here quite often for, for about four years. I played here uh, at least once a month with my different bands. And it was always fun because you never knew who was going to come into the Earl of Old Town. A lot of famous people would wander in and you'd be playing your set and looking over in the corner, there was like Vincent Price or, you know, or, or Lalo Schifrin who wrote you know, Mission Impossible came in one night. Uh, of course, Chris Christopherson, uh, 
Bob Dylan would wander in, so it was an amazing place. And I wonder, does that go on anywhere today anymore? I don't, I don't know if it does. Let me get my water here. If anybody knows where there's a scene like that going on, please tell me, because I can't find it. <laughs> Two Way Street, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I play Two Way Street myself too. But but what I, what I was referring to was the fact that major name people would, would wander in to see who was playing it. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen that happen in Two Way Street. They have incredible people playing there, of course. You know, now I play there. I don't know if I'm incredible, but I do play there myself. But they have some wonderful, wonderful acts at Two Way Street. You know, and they've been around a long time. 1970, Two Way Street's been going going strong. Yeah. Okay, and here you have. A poster with four of the giants of the Chicago folk music scene at that time. All on one poster. Bonnie Kolak, Jim Post, John Prine, Steve Goodman, all doing shows at this famous club within just a few weeks of each other. It was just phenomenal, the things that went on at that club. Who do we have here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this, uh, this was an event that we did at Fitzgerald's um, in June of 2012, so it's been about a year and a half now. But Earl Pianchi was the owner of the uh, Earl of Old Town and it was his 80th birthday. So a whole bunch of us got together and did a big birthday party for him and performed. And then you see here, uh, Jim Post on the left, next to him is John Prine. That's me behind them, between he and Bonnie Kolak, and Brian Bowers over there on the left. Uh, uh, it was a fabulous event, it was one that I will never forget. Probably the last time all those people will get together again too. Now, in case you don't recognize the fellow on the far right in the black hair and the beard, of course, that's me. <laughs> that was my band at the time. We were called the Casualaires. Uh, it's a band that's largely forgotten today, but it was very popular on the Lincoln Avenue circuit back, back in those days. We did a lot of um, arrangements of songs from the 1930s and 40s, you know, Busby Berkeley type numbers of four-part harmonies. Uh, it was a very unique group, but in those days, People were willing to listen to something different, where today the saying is people know what they like and they like what they know. So it's kind of hard to introduce people to, to something new and different today. They, you know, they want to hear what they already know, which is why you have so many tribute bands, basically. Now, Chicago is probably more famous around the world for its blues scene than any other type of music. And one of the reasons that uh, scene thrived as it did was the fact that the record labels, such as Chess, Delmark, VJ, and other labels, we're all here in Chicago, uh, and it's a good chance that a blues player could land a very lucrative recording contract if they came here. Uh, and Maxwell Street, which is what this scene is right here, the Maxwell Street's connection to the Chicago music scene uh, goes back a long way as a haven for blues musicians, long before it became famous, of course, in 1977, film The Blues Brothers. Uh, it goes all the way back to the 1940s, at least, where musicians were already setting up and playing on the street while the shoppers were hurrying by looking for their bargains. Uh, but the players discovered after a while they needed something louder than just an acoustic guitar or a harmonica in order to be heard over the din. So, at that point, the electric blues were born when they began plugging their guitars into amplifiers and they gave birth to a whole new Chicago sound. Uh, this is John Davis playing here. He played on Maxwell Street for over 30 years. He would drive his, his little Econoline van in there and plug in someplace and just start, start playing. And that's how the scene was back then before I guess it was University of Chicago came in and leveled the whole thing out. So. Of course, this is Muddy Waters, who spent his last years living in uh, suburban Westmont, by the way, not too far from here. And this, of course, is Howlin' Wolf. These are two of Chicago's most famous blues musicians. Both of these men made their way to Chicago from the South during a great migration of African Americans that took place following World War II. Uh, the musicians among them brought with them a form of music known as the Delta Blues at that time. And Muddy Waters and Holland Wolf were the first two guys to plug their guitars in and form that new style of electric blues that became identified as the Chicago sound. Um, you probably know one of Muddy's most famous tunes called Manish Boy or I'm a Man. I'm a man, I was built in. Man. It was a relatively obscure blues tune, but then we got a band from England called the Yardbirds who took the song and they turned it into a rock and roll song. And I'm a man, I spell M, 
song and it's spreading the Chicago sound out to the world now because now the world's starting to hear what this Chicago thing is all about and I'm sure that Muddy was thrilled by the, the royalties he probably got for that too. This is Willie Dixon. Willie Dixon was a blues bass player who became associated with Chess Records as a producer and a songwriter. Uh, he penned many famous songs, some of which were eventually recorded by The Doors, Eric Clapton, Led Zeppelin, among others. So you can see how far reaching the Chicago sound is, is now becoming, even around the world. Uh, you may recognize titles like Hoochie Coochie Man, Spoonful, Backdoor Man, Wang Dang Doodle. Um, he also produced a lot of songs, and I believe he produced uh, Bring It Out Home To Me by Sam Cooke, one of my favorites. If you ever change your mind about leaving, leaving me behind, oh, bring it to me. Bring your sweet loving, bring it out over me, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know I laughed when you left, but you know I only, only hurt myself. Oh, bring it to me, bring your sweet loving, bring it out home to me, yeah, yeah, yeah. Classic, classic blues. It's of course the Checkerboard Lounge. It's the original Checkerboard Lounge, which was a famous South Side nightclub where many legendary blues live albums were cut back in those days. And this is also the club of the outer town.